and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. I'm with you in your handles on page 152, 153, and following. We're going to take a look at a couple of essays. The first one, Rachel Carson's The Marginal World, and then, and, and then we'll move on to the Making, uh, Making History with Vitamin C essay. Um, uh, just for a real quick observation, let's start actually at 3A. In your freshman year, You'll maybe, I hope, remember that we did a brief cutting, the opening lines from Rachel Carson's classic, Silent Spring, where she talked about an ideal place that's damaged or destroyed by chemicals that have been put into the ground, into the air, into the water, and destroying then the spring, making, killing all the birds, here goes Silent Spring. Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's most famous text. We're going we're gonna to meet Rachel Carson again. Before we get there, though, I'm with you on page 153. I hope at 2B you have written down author's purpose, that is to say, main reason for writing. We have three bullet points that are provided here. There's different reasons an author might produce. One of those is to inform, explain, persuade, describe, entertain. He or she may have more than one purpose. An author's primary purpose is to inform or persuade. The author presents a thesis. Let's get that word down. We, of course, know this word from our own compositional work, yes. Thesis, the main point or claim about the subject. To explain and prove the thesis, the author supplies support, evidence, facts, other details confirming the thesis. The author's purpose is also reflected in his or her rhetoric and style, right, to be for us, of course, style, the ways in which he or she uses language. Word choice, sentence length, sentence complexity contribute to an author's style. So we want to pay attention as we read here. We're also, write this down, we're at to be. We're going to be focusing on cause and effect, cause and event and action or a situation that makes something happen. An effect is the event that uh, results to analyze cause and effect, determine which events cause which effects. And then, of course, a chart, like the sequence chart at the bottom of 153 can help you. Uh-oh, 154. Remember, you want to pay attention to the vocabulary that is a part of that uh, of our project here, so that way you're ready to go um, as we go forward with our, with our um, assessment. Hey, let's meet Rachel Carson one more time. There's a picture of her on 155, 1907 to 1964. A lifelong lover of nature, Rachel Carson trained as a marine biologist at a time when few women pursued the study of the sea. She worked for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and wrote po uh, poetically about nature in books like The Sea Around Us, which won the National Book Award. A crusade, next heading. One day a friend wrote to complain that many birds had died on her property after it was sprayed, by, uh, sprayed for insects. Carson decided she had to show the world that people were damaging the environment with insecticides. In 1962, it's huge, write this down. In 1962, she published her book, Silent Spring, a pioneering environmental work that, again, we saw in our freshman year. As a result of Carson's Silent Spring, the insecticide DDT was eventually banned. Now, to read The Marginal World, what we'll be uh, reading now, um, we got some background information. Take a look on 155. Let's learn a little about tides. The pull of the moon's gravity is strongest on the part of the earth that's closest to the moon. As the earth rotates, the area that is closest to the moon changes. The result is tides, the daily changes in water level at the ocean shore. Each day, the edge of the shore is flooded and then exposed by the tides. Rachel Carson explores the, crea uh, the creatures that live in this special zone, that is to say, the marginal world. So let's put this in our notes right away at level one. This will be an essay in which poetically, in many ways, beautiful, beautiful prose for Rachel Carson's, we are going to learn about tidal zones, that is to say, marginal worlds, right? The, the main focus here, by the way, jot it down, will be philosophical, the way we think about it. In language that is more often poetic than scientific, Carson's going to describe the sight, sounds, feelings that contribute to her appreciation of this delicate, and changeable region. Now, the challenge for us here is, can I say this? I hope you're listening. In our sophomore year, we began, of course, the process of preparing for our ACTs. Part of our ACTs, I said it was a three-hour reading test. When you're doing the math section of the ACT, you're, you're reading. When you do the science section of the ACT, you are reading. One of the most important things you can do in preparation for your ACTs in, in your junior year is to actually begin to read scientific literature. 
Like, for example, your textbook. If you're in a biology class or you're in an earth science class, you should be trying to read from the actual textbook. We're going to have an example of this. Some of you will find this reading to be difficult to stay focused with. Unlike the reading, for example, of fiction, where there is suspense and excitement and all of that, you may be challenged a bit, initially at least, by reading this kind of material. I'm going to challenge you to conquer monkey mind, to sit up and pay close attention to the words. When you see your mind wandering away, your eyes wandering away from the reading, bring yourself back. I'm going to challenge you to see if you can get all the way through this reading. Of course, you've probably already glanced over the pages to see how long that it is. I'm with you now on page 157. Let's enjoy the powerful prose of Rachel Carson. Let's learn a little bit about tides as well. Here we go. An introduction to the marginal world, shall we? The Marginal World by Rachel Carson. The edge of the sea is a strange and beautiful place. All through the long history of Earth, it has been an area of unrest, where waves have broken heavily against the land, where the tides have pressed forward over the continents, receded, and then returned. For no two successive days is the shoreline precisely the same. 158. Not only do the tides advance and retreat in their eternal rhythms, but the level of the sea itself is never at rest. It rises or falls as the glaciers melt or grow, as the floor of the deep ocean basins shift under its increasing load of sediments, or as the Earth's crust along the continental margins warps up or down in adjustment to strain and tension. Today, a little more land may belong to the sea. Tomorrow, a little less. Always, the edge of the sea remains an elusive and indefinable boundary. All right, let's pause. Take a look at your textbook. They're helping you to be a, 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 a good reader of scientific uh, nonfiction. Notice the literary analysis author's purpose. Which sentence in the opening paragraph, in your estimation, states the author's thesis? Go ahead and, and, and decide which one of those sentences uh, for you is the, is the thesis. And most students will say, while that opening first line is a great first line, the edge of the sea is strange and beautiful place. And the last line of that, uh, uh, of that paragraph on 157 for no two successive days is the shoreline precisely the same. Probably the best single line that is the thesis line is the last sentence of this paragraph on page 158. Always the edge of the sea remains an elusive and indefinable boundary. I actually had a student, let me just set you up for this, who after the reading and the study of this essay, loved so much the way that Rachel Carson's could make something so painfully boring like a shoreline, the tides, come alive, that she decided to enjoy her biology class at a different level. She ended up writing a pretty good ACT score, especially in science went on to university, and became a marine biologist, someone who gave her whole life to the study of the very thing we're about to learn about. Let's see if we can enjoy, raise your curiosity level, your attention level. Let's see what we can learn about tides, something maybe you took for total granted, and yet let's learn about them. The shore has a dual nature, changing with the swing of the tides belonging now to the land, now to the sea. On the ebb tide, it knows the harsh extremes of the land world, being exposed to heat and cold, to wind, to rain and drying sun. On the flood tide, it is a water world, returning briefly to the relative stability of the open sea. Only the most hardy and adaptable can survive in a region so mutable. Yet the area between the tide lines is crowded with plants and animals. In this difficult world of the shore, life displays its enormous toughness and vitality by occupying almost every conceivable niche. Visibly, it carpets the intertidal rocks, or half hidden, it descends into fissures and crevices, or hides under boulders, or lurks in the wet gloom of sea caves. Invisibly, where the casual observer would say there is no life, it lies deep in the sand, in burrows and tubes and passageways. It tunnels into solid rock 
and bores into peat and clay. It encrusts weeds or drifting spars or the hard, chitinous shell of a lobster. It exists minutely as the film of bacteria that spreads over a rock surface or a wharf piling, as spheres of protozoa, small as pinpricks, sparkling at the surface of the sea, and as Lilliputian beings swimming through dark pools that lie between the grains of sand. The shore is an ancient world. For as long as there has been an earth and sea, there has been this place of the meeting of land and water. Yet it is a world that keeps alive the sense of continuing creation and of the relentless drive of life. Each time that I enter it, I gain some new awareness of its beauty and its deeper meanings, sensing that intricate fabric of life by which one creature is linked with another and each with its surroundings. In my thoughts of the shore, one place stands apart for its revelation of exquisite beauty. It is a pool hidden within a cave that one can visit only rarely and briefly when the lowest of the year's low tides fall below it. And perhaps from that very fact, it acquires some of its special beauty. Choosing such a tide, I hoped for a glimpse of the pool. The ebb was to fall early in the morning. I knew that if the wind held from the northwest and no interfering swell ran in from a distant storm, the level of the sea should drop below the entrance to the pool. There had been sudden, ominous showers in the night, with rain like handfuls of gravel flung on the roof. When I looked out into the early morning, the sky was full of a gray dawn light, but the sun had not yet risen. Water and air were pallid. Across the bay, the moon was a luminous disk in the western sky, suspended above the dim line of distant shore, the full August moon drawing the tide to the low, low levels of the threshold of the alien sea world. As I watched, a gull flew by above the spruces. Its breast was rosy with the light of the unrisen sun. The day was, after all, to be fair. All right, let's pause for a moment. Some readers of this essay have pointed out at the top of page 159 that we really have a second thesis, a second focused sentence, which draws Rachel Carson's with the pronoun I right into the essay itself. Take a look at the line, the shore, the, the paragraph at the top of 159. The shore is an ancient world for as long as there's been an earth and sea, there's been this place of the meeting of land and water. I've had students that say, I guess I never really thought about that. But as long as there's been earth, there's been sea. And as long as there's been sea, there's been this meeting place between the two. Keep reading. Yet it's a world that keeps alive the sense of continuing creation and of the relentless drive of life. You can jump back over to page 158. Only the most hardy and adaptable can survive in a region so mutable. Of course, anytime we're studying anything that's in biology, we... Uh, immediately start thinking about the great Charles Darwin and his notion about the survival of species and the survival of the fittest and natural selection. We're back to that idea again. Each time, she says it, each time I enter it, I gain some new awareness of its beauty, its deeper meanings, sensing that intricate fabric of life by which one creature is linked with another and each with its surroundings. Let's pause at level 2A. One of the obvious messages of this essay here already provided for us is the way everything in our world is interconnected. We often don't think of it that way, right? So, for example, I heard a student the other day who loves rap music but was speaking against gospel spiritual music that is sung at church. And I had to explain to him, no, no, if you understood the history of music, you would know there is no rap music until there is gospel spiritual music. Because in America especially, so much of the music that you listen to today grew out of that experience, right? Everything is interrelated, and she makes this point. When you look at the, way, at the world of nature, one of the important lessons is 
we're all somehow connected in a fundamental way. This is what we meant, by the way, earlier of talking about this essay as a philosophic essay. We're all connected in profound ways. Now, there's different ways to understand that. We can read a story, for example, that explains that. Notice here we're reading an informal or a formal uh, nonfiction piece of writing, a scientific essay where she plays the same game. Number two, notice how she leads you into the world of the pool, as we sometimes have called it. That is to say, there's this cave that she likes to visit, but she can only visit this cave at one time of the year when the tides are so depressed, so low, that we're able to finally get into this cave and then begin to see all of the amazing life form that's going to be there. I have taught students, because of course I teach in the middle of a desert, who have never actually been to the ocean. If you've been to the ocean at 3B, you can jot down really quickly the last time you were there, if you can remember it, the last time you were at the ocean, and the games that got played on the shoreline between the water and the, and the land, and how much fun that was as children, of course, were always amazed at all of the life that's there, right? Those sand crabs, if you're there among the rocks and everything that's living. Finally, notice that even though this is a piece of nonfiction, not a piece of fiction, not a short story, notice Carson's use of simile and metaphor. For example, on page 159 in the last paragraph there, there had been sudden ominous showers in the night with rain-like handfuls of gravel flung on the roof. In other words, that simile of comparison using like or as. Notice a few moments later, across the bay, the moon was a luminous disk. This is a metaphor. The moon was a luminous disk in the western side, sky. Finally, remember what we said about varying sentence length as writers and how important that is? Take a look at this paragraph and the ways in which we get these long sentences, but the last sentence is, notice, the day was, after all, to be fair, a very short sentence. Again, Carson following that same rule of varying sentence length. All right, last lines on 159, on to 160. Let's really try and concentrate and enjoy what she has to say about this magic pool. Later, as I stood above the tide near the entrance to the pool, the promise of that rosy light was sustained. From the base of the steep wall of rock on which I stood, a moss-covered ledge jutted seaward into deep water. Page 160. In the surge at the rim of the ledge, the dark fronds of oarweeds swayed, smooth and gleaming as leather. The projecting ledge was the path to the small hidden cave and its pool. Occasionally, a swell, stronger than the rest, rolled smoothly over the rim and broke in foam against the cliff. But the intervals between such swells were long enough to admit me to the ledge and long enough for a glimpse of that fairy pool, so seldom and so briefly exposed. And so I knelt on the wet carpet of sea moss and looked back into the dark cavern that held the pool in a shallow basin. The floor of the cave was only a few inches below the roof, and a mirror had been created in which all that grew on the ceiling was reflected in the still water below. Under water that was clear as glass, the pool was carpeted with green sponge. Gray patches of sea squirts glistened on the ceiling, and colonies of soft coral were a pale apricot color. In the moment when I looked into the cave, a little elfin starfish hung down, suspended by the merest thread, perhaps by only a single tube foot. It reached down to touch its own reflection, so perfectly delineated that there might have been not one starfish, but two. The beauty of the reflected images and of the limpid pool itself was the poignant beauty of things that are ephemeral existing only until the sea should return to fill the little cave. Whenever I go down into this magical zone of the low water of the spring tides, I look for the most delicately beautiful of all the shore's inhabitants, flowers that are not plant but animal, blooming on the threshold of the deeper sea. In that fairy cave I was not disappointed. Hanging from its roof were the pendant flowers of the hydroid tubularia, pale pink, fringed and delicate as the wind flower. Here were creatures so exquisitely fashioned that they seemed unreal, their beauty too fragile to exist in a world of crushing force. 
Yet every detail was functionally useful. Every stalk and hydranth and petal-like tentacle fashioned for dealing with the realities of existence. I knew that they were merely waiting, in that moment of the tide's ebbing, for the return of the sea. Then in the rush of water, in the surge of surf and the pressure of the incoming tide, the delicate flower heads would stir with life. They would sway on their slender stalks and their long tentacles would sweep the returning water, finding in it all that they needed for life. And so in that enchanted place on the threshold of the sea, the realities that possessed my mind were far from those of the land world I had left an hour before. In a different way, the same sense of remoteness and of a world apart came to me in a twilight hour on a great beach on the coast of Georgia. I had come down after sunset and walked far out over the sands that lay wet and gleaming to the very edge of the retreating sea. Looking back across that immense flat, crossed by winding water-filled gullies, and here and there holding shallow pools left by the tide, I was filled with awareness that this intertidal area, although abandoned briefly and rhythmically by the sea, is always reclaimed by the rising tide. There at the edge of low water, the beach with its reminders of the land seemed far away. The only sounds were those of the wind and the sea and the birds. There was one sound of wind moving over water, and another of water sliding over the sand and tumbling down the faces of its own wave forms. The flats were astir with birds, and the voice of the willet rang insistently. One of them stood at the edge of the water and gave its loud, urgent cry. An answer came from far up the beach, and the two birds flew to join each other. The flats took on a mysterious quality as dusk approached, and the last evening light was reflected from the scattered pools and creeks. Then birds became only dark shadows, with no color discernible. Sanderlings scurried across the beach like little ghosts, and here and there the darker forms of the willets stood out. Often I could come very 